Okay, good morning to everybody. We are starting our traditional uh, seminar organized by Friends of European Russia Forum and also by EU Neighborhood East Forum, which we established here in the European Parliament. My name is Andrew Skubilius. I am one of the initiators of those forums, uh, which became quite an important tradition for us to discuss major issues connected with developments in Russia and in Eastern partnership countries. And today we have a really very important uh, discussion with prominent, uh, prominent experts, a uh, discussion on uh, European gas prices search and market manipulation by Gazprom. So there is no need perhaps to explain what all of us we faced recently, you know, both on uh, EU markets and in Eastern partnership countries, especially Moldova and Ukraine. And uh, uh, definitely that is quite, uh, quite uh, threatening developments, especially if you look in, in general into Kremlin policies around, you know, with uh, buildup of military forces on the borders of Ukraine, with uh, smuggling of migrants, you know, crisis of that, of those uh, migration crisis, you know, hybrid war, which, which was uh, organized by Lukashenko, but of course with Kremlin support on the borders of uh, Belarus towards EU. So that, that is general picture. And of course, we, we need to look uh, really uh, what uh, was happening and what is happening and what can happen uh, during you know, uh, uh, forthcoming weeks and months during this winter season. But also we need to perhaps to look into, into a broader picture what will be the consequences of that, uh, uh, of those recent developments, you know, uh, looking into a longer term future, could, you know, uh, if, if Gazprom and gas, you know, as energy resource will stay as reliable, you know, providers of uh, energy resources to European Union, I, I doubt, I think that uh, really we, we could make a, a general conclusion that you know Gazprom is not anymore a reliable, uh, reliable uh, provider of uh, gas resources, especially when we are talking also about situation in Eastern Partnership countries. And then, of course, a question uh, looking into longer term perspective: what will be consequences for EU policies? Uh, I'm, I have in mind Green Deal. Uh, should we? push Green Deal uh, you know, in a more effective way, because gas is not anymore a very, very reliable uh, uh, source. And what will be the consequences for uh, longer term developments in Russia itself? That, those are the questions which we perhaps will uh, touch also today. Uh, we had a special seminar back in, in July on, uh, on uh, geopolitical consequences of Green Deal. So this is in some way continuation of our, of our earlier discussions. And uh, before we shall start uh, uh, real discussion, some kind of logistics. So uh, uh, invited speakers uh, will speak uh, you know, at the very beginning, uh, having you know, from, from you know, up to seven minutes each to, to speak. Then his possibility to put your questions for, for the audience, you should put them into the chat, not into questions and answers, but into the chat. That's that's easy possibility. Uh, and uh, that is how we shall proceed. Now, really, I will start you know, with, with the first speakers. Really, we have uh, prominent speakers today. There is no need uh, to introduce them, you know, I will try to introduce each, each of them, you know, when, when the time will come. Uh, the first uh, speaker, very well known for us, for our community, Vladimir Milov, uh, very well known politician, associate of Alexei Navalny, and former deputy minister of energy of Russia. So Vladimir, uh, and you were one of the initiators of this specific seminar, you know, so yeah, please go on, floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Andres, for arranging this very timely, extremely timely discussion. Uh, I wonder why not so much debate is going on on this uh, particular issue of 
European gas crisis and market manipulation. This really deserves an in-depth analysis and uh, discussion about what's going on beyond just media headlines. And um, I would like to start first with uh, characterizing what has been going on in the past few weeks and months. Uh, it uh, brings me back to a nostalgic memories of my regulatory youth uh, when I was working in, in regulating Gazprom in the Russian government. This is a very, very clear cut case for the books uh, about how you detect uh, market manipulation on part of a monopoly. Uh, and Gazprom obviously has been denying this, but uh, I will just give some uh, brief advices uh, on uh, which, which ways to look to actually detect wrongdoing on their part. First, uh, you should really compare their behavior this year with previous decades. Uh, Gazprom has been supplying uh, Europe for decades, and usually they always released uh, any needed additional volume whenever European consumers have been asking for it. They have been boasting about uh, delivering record volumes of supplies, even during the low price uh, years, like uh, 2020 was a year of relatively low level of European gas prices. It was just well over $100 per thousand cubic meters, but they still uh, delivered any additional volumes uh, which uh, customers had requested for. Not this year. Uh, we saw since the first months of this year, we saw a very abrupt uh, change in behavior. Gazprom has been saying, no, we can only deliver the minimum contractual obligations and nothing more than that. We simply don't have the gas. And in connection with that, you saw all the information that uh, they have not been booking uh, additional transit capacities through Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland uh, with the same explanation that we cannot deliver extra volume because we don't have the gas. Now, at the very same time, when they said that uh, they don't have extra volumes of gas, uh, they kept reporting, for instance, about a record injection of uh, gas into Russian uh, underground storage facilities and the storage facilities in the former Soviet Union, which they control. So the total figure is next to 75 billion cubic meters injected into Russian uh, storages for this winter season, which is about a quarter higher than last winter, which was indeed reported a year ago to be a record uh, figure by then. It was just over 60 BCM, and Gazprom said we have never injected so much. Uh, that's a record-breaking number. Now this uh, season they had injected uh, almost a quarter more. So there is additional gas. There is this about 15 billion cubic meters of extra gas which were injected into Russian storages instead. Now, the explanation for this action is extremely thin. Uh, they say, oh, we expect uh, colder winter than usual, but uh, come on, there are no objective forecasts for that. Really, this volume would suggest that they're expecting a, a return of little ice age or something, but uh, this simply does not correspond to the reality on the ground and any meteorological forecasts. So uh, the answer is very simple. Yes, they do have the additional volumes of gas, but they prefer not to supply them to European consumers, not to inject them into European gas storage facilities, but store these gas uh, in Russia. So the explanation that uh, they just uh, don't have the additional volume simply doesn't stick. Yes, they do have. Now, the next important thing is their behavior regarding their uh, storage capacity, which they control in Europe. They have accumulated a very significant storage capacity, which is used as a leverage to influence the market. And yes, we have seen in the past few weeks and months uh, that uh, Gazprom has been running much lower than the other owners of uh, storage facilities in Europe in terms of injection. Uh, uh, other storages, which are not controlled by Gazprom, were filled more or less normal compared to previous years uh, uh, in terms of volumes of gas injected before the winter season. Now, where storages were running low and uh, much lower than uh, the usual numbers, uh, these were the storage facilities in the high deck and others which were uh, controlled by Gazprom. So at the same time, while not uh, replying to requests of European consumers for additional uh, gas supplies, Gazprom has not been injecting sufficient volumes of gas into their own storage facilities in Europe. 
At the same time, again, I would repeat, they are reporting a record filling of uh, gas storages in Russia. So yes, gas is there. Uh, now, if this is not a market manipulation, then I don't know what it is, uh, because I think this clearly corresponds to the uh, provisions of the European antitrust legislation, which speak about withholding the goods, the commodities for the purpose of bringing the price up. Uh, I think that's, that's a very clear uh, proven case. Of course, uh, when uh, people say that the reasons for the price surge are fundamental, they are right. It's growing demand uh, for gas in Asia. Essentially, gas market is becoming more and more globalized because of uh, increasing uh, supplies of LNG. So a lot of gas went into the premium Asian market, where actually essentially European prices have been following the surge in uh, gas prices in Asia. That's correct. But on top of that, there's a very clear element of market manipulation because Gazprom is also fully aware of the situation that Asian price surge would influence the European market. So what they did is they simply added fuel to the fire, which essentially gives you a hint of how they will behave in uh, this type of crisis in the future, which also questions the reliability of Gazprom as a partner big time. And this crisis actually proves than those uh, who said over the previous years and decades that Europe should diversify sources of supply, uh, encourage more competition uh, at the European gas market, they were right. Because dependency on Gazprom can be frightening. We saw this uh, in the recent few weeks. Uh, this market manipulation had added uh, significantly to European gas uh, price crisis. And Gazprom could have uh, dramatically calmed down of the situation at the European market by providing a you know, relatively small volume of additional supplies as per requests uh, from uh, European consumers. This would also not come for free. Gazprom would have received the record prices for that. So uh, nobody is asking them to supply gas for free, just a little additional volume for a record high prices and the crisis would have been solved. So. We wouldn't, have, we, we wouldn't have to conduct seminars uh, like this right now. But they were specifically withholding the volume for the purpose of pushing prices further up and also showing how much leverage they have on the European energy market, provoking all this you know, outcry that, listen, we're going to freeze out in the winter without Russian gas, so we need to be more gentle with Putin. We need to have a dialogue. Uh, we need to maybe lift some sanctions and start stuff like that. So I'm sure uh, uh, besides purely commercial rationing, there was also this uh, geopolitical thinking present when they wanted to show uh, the leverage on Europe. I think it is very important uh, that uh, Europe acts now to prevent such a monopolistic behavior from occurring on our European space ever again because this is damaging to everyone, including Russia, because uh, uh, all this situation, I think it's well understood by the industry experts, uh, policymakers. I think the implications for Russia can be terrible because this would lead more people to think that we need to get rid of dependency on Russian supplies faster. So Russia will simply lose market with actions like that in the longer term. So uh, I think we, we, we need to understand that in our European space, we need to act swiftly to prevent uh, any such sort of monopolistic behavior occurring ever again, which is why I'm really very much surprised uh, about the inaction on part of the European Commission. I heard uh, prominent people like Franz Timmermans and others uh, essentially snubbing this issue of market manipulation. And, openly saying that, no, we don't think that manipulation is involved. Uh, it's probably a natural market occurrence that the prices went so high. I think uh, this inaction and uh, such words only encourage Gazprom for further behavior of a similar sort. We read the news of the past 24 hours. Again, they have been reducing uh, levels of injection of gas into European storages and so on. So uh, I think action is needed. The antitrust investigation against Gazprom should be open tomorrow, uh, and there is ample evidence that market manipulation was involved, for which they should be issued significant fines. Uh, and 
yesterday I read the news that uh, the European Commission is opening an antitrust case against Google with potential multi-billion dollar files. But this is more dangerous. They should prioritize Gazprom uh, over Google because really, Andreas, you mentioned that um, uh, we are into the green deal and energy transition, but gas will still serve as an important bridge fuel. And before Europe builds a, a full blown green economy, uh, gas supplies from Russia will play a significant part, will have a lot of impact on the European economy uh, and uh, Russian manipulation can, can have a long, uh, long standing negative effect. So, I suggest that this case uh, is to be opened right now, and also some regulatory implications uh, need to follow, like, for instance, uh, a European third energy package regulates gas transport, but as we see in the current crisis, uh, they uh, absolutely under-regulate storage facilities, which are crucial for the markets, particularly in the peaks of consumption. So what Gazprom did, and uh, the third package uh, logic is that uh, uh, gas producers and suppliers should sell and do not control transmission networks. But at the same time, they're fully allowed to control storages. And you see how they use this important piece of infrastructure to actually manipulate uh, the market. So we clearly see that there are regulatory loopholes, but then again, I strongly advise that this antitrust investigation against Gazprom is to be open right now with certain regulatory implications also drawn uh, to prevent uh, this monopolistic behavior from uh, happening anywhere uh, in the future. I'll, I'll finish with that and uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Vladimir. And uh, of course, you reminded uh, me uh, what we were trying to do here in the parliament. Uh, months ago, perhaps, or even more, uh, we I initiated a special letter to uh, to EU institutions exactly to start investigation uh, you know, of, of gas pro manipulations in the market. But still, we are not receiving any kind of uh, answer what, what institutions are ready to do. And that is why I'm very happy that today we have also, uh, you know, among speakers, Jerzy uh, Buzek, uh, with whom we are doing quite quite a lot of you know uh, initiatives in that field, and there is no need really to to present Jerzy Buzek, you know, uh, who who was uh, prime minister of Poland, uh, president of European Parliament, now member of European Parliament, and of course in European Parliament we know that Jerzy Buzek knows everything about uh, gas uh, markets, gas directives, you know, since he was also a standing uh, uh, rapporteur, rapporteur for the gas directive uh, revisions and, and security of gas supplies regulation. So yes, a pleasure to, to have you and yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrews. Uh, it's a great possibility to be with you. Uh, good morning, I would say, because I'm in Brussels, it is uh, 11.20 and probably where are you just now? It is uh, slightly later, maybe after the noon. So, well, great topic, I would like to say, Andrews. And uh, I am very glad that I can uh, show you maybe the point of view uh, of European Union and European Commission, European Parliament. How does it look like uh, the crisis? Who is responsible? Uh, maybe some important issues were, were said uh, a few minutes ago, but even if I repeat it from the point of view of EU, will be will be quite clear what we are talking about. Uh, so uh, this crisis is not entirely Russia's fault, of course. A last cold winter and depletion of the storages, increasing global demand uh, after COVID recovery, and of course uh, Asia as it was said, uh, it's natural, but Russian Federation, by, by our opinion, not only refused to be a part of the solution, it yet again became a part of the problem. And it was in European Commission communication on tackling, tackling rising energy prices, a toolbox, a toolbox for action and support. And they say Gazprom has offered little or no extra capacity to ease pressure on the EU gas market. 
So we can say very shortly, it is uh, weaponizing uh, energy policy, as a matter of fact. Um, it would be a geopolitical agenda uh, from our point of view. And there are some, some very simple examples. Uh, Gazprom owned storages in the EU are the least built in uh, and, and therefore not prepared to meet the upcoming winter demand. Gazprom decided not to use the existing network through Poland, Ukraine, uh, and uh, having huge profit uh, uh, currently, it would be possible for Gazprom a very unusual behavior for a supposedly uh, profit-driven business entity. And uh, uh, according to the International Energy Agency, uh, as far as I remember, at least 15% increase in supplies is possible. Uh, and also in, in the series of public comments, uh, key Kremlin figures uh, clearly linked the approval of Nord Stream 2 Restabilization of the European gas market, advancing Russia's political agenda of intimidation and, and blackmail. Uh, so it's very worrying signal. Um, uh, with have, with with uh, which might have uh, far-reaching consequences for our citizens, businesses, and stability of the EU as a whole. This is why I joined the initiative of of you, uh, dear uh, Andrews, asking the, commi the Commission to in investigate urgently uh, a suspected market manipulation by Gazprom. And uh, for me, it's very important to answer the question, what uh, does Russia, by our opinion, from the EU point of view, want to achieve by this pressure? Um, well, let me say, it is building on its long-standing doctrine where energy is seen as political weapon and exploiting the global gas shortages. And as a result, it could strengthen monopolistic position uh, of, of, of Gazprom in the EU gas market and speed up the certification of the Nord Stream 2. As a big problem because we've got uh, three points on the list. Uh, ownership unbounding, very difficult for Gazprom uh, on consortium today, absolutely difficult. Uh, second, third parties access. It means um, no such a big income that it was uh, uh, well, uh, uh, was, 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 was previously uh, thought it could be uh, the income of the uh, uh, gas pipeline. And the uh, third issue is uh, transparency in all the taxes and tariffs. And so it's not easy to achieve all of them. Uh, so uh, reshape the EU energy policy at the end. It would be the most dangerous from our point of view. Why? Because we built our energy policy on liberalized market solutions. And now in such a situation, um, it could be something like pressing for long-term EU contracts away from the liberalized uh, market solutions. Another very in, uh, important issue is move part of the spot market purchases from Rotterdam, for example, to East, to, to online platform in St. Petersburg, and maybe undermining US LNG is also possible. And in the European Union, everything what is happening now fuels populists discontent and destabilize the EU. And long-term strategy could be undermining the European Green Deal. That's very dangerous because uh, European Green Deal, if it is successful, 
could change the current paradigm of EU, Russia, Russia, energy trade. Because uh, in 20, 30 years, we expect on the basis of EU Green Deal to stop any import of natural gas to the EU as fossil fuel. So from this point of view, to undermine the Green Deal as a strategic program uh, for new civilization all over the, 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 the earth, uh, our globe, uh, it is very important goal and task for uh, such a manipulation today. It's our perspective, and I am very keen to, to listen to all the other opinions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks a lot. Yes, uh, really, uh, very, very good, uh, good uh, points. Now I am turning to Anders Aslund, you know, who again, you know, is very well known in our, in our, all our seminars and conversations and with his uh, publications, papers, you know, uh, economists, you know, now senior fellow at Stockholm Free World Forum for quite a long time before that he was with Atlantic Council. Uh, so thanks a lot, Anders, for joining us, as we understand from Washington, you know, you are from now in Washington, so still it's five o'clock or something like that in the morning. Uh, so really, you are suffering, <laughs> but uh, but uh, issues which you know we are discussing really are very important. And knowing that, I would call you, you know the best expert worldwide on on both on Russia, on Eastern Partnership, and even on Europe. You know, especially in some in some areas of of economical development, but. Before you will start, I have one question, which Anders is also, uh, I don't know if you have so seen it in, in chat. Uh, I, would, I would really would like that you would elaborate during your, your initial statement also on that question. And the question comes from, from Lithuania, from journalist Gabriele Grigosaitita. Uh, the question for, which is addressed to you, Anders, to uh, Vladimir Milov and to me. Uh, and the question sounds like that. Uh, German Vice Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who is going to become a, a chancellor, says that Germany must build large scale new gas power stations to guarantee energy security. So what will be the political risks of dependence from Russia, you know, in, if such kind of plan with the new government will be really realized? And is it a push for Nord Stream to launch? So I mean, uh, if you can elaborate Anders a little bit also, not only what Russia is doing, but also what 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 is happening in Europe on, on the European side, and especially you now with a uh, you know next uh, next German government, which uh, has uh, Green Party as a coalition partner, but if if that really will change, you know German attitude. So Anders, please floor is yours. And mute yourself still. still thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and thank you for including me. You again are muted. Anders, stop, something here Sorry. again. Now, now it's good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and thank you for including me in this uh, very prominent uh, panel. And uh, of course, uh, this is the topic that we need to discuss uh, today. So I'm happy that you do that. I think that uh, Vladimir Milov very clearly clarified why this is market manipulation. So I'm not going to discuss that. And uh, Prime Minister Buzek uh, discussed a lot about uh, what the EU should do now. I would like to focus on the Russian aims in this situation. You touched upon it a bit in the beginning, Andrews, but that needs to be uh, considered <clears throat> more. So what is Russia intent on doing now? What we are seeing is a massive broad front attack by Russia, a hybrid attack on many specific countries. It's worth noticing that, the, that Russia currently ignores the European Union as such. When Putin attacked uh, uh, the EU uh, on the 13th of uh, October in his big uh, uh, energy uh, uh, speech, he uh, focused on the former commission of the European Union and ignored the uh, current uh, EU, EU authorities. So what is the aim? Uh, <clears throat> well, it has already been said, primarily by Prime Minister Buzek, 
to break the third energy uh, package. And uh, the alternative is to return to long-term contracts tied to oil. Putin has um, himself specified that very clearly. Another obvious aim uh, is to uh, get uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, certified. An obvious aim always is to hurt Ukraine, also by uh, cutting uh, uh, coal uh, deliveries to the power stations in, in uh, Ukraine and prohibiting uh, electricity exports uh, uh, to Ukraine, to force Moldova to abandon the European Association uh, agreement and uh, instead uh, uh, force uh, Moldova into the uh, Eurasian Economic uh, Union. And uh, of course, to break uh, sanctions uh, uh, against uh, Russia. There are other issues also. Uh, convince uh, Serbia to buy uh, uh, Russian arms uh, so that uh, Serbia cannot uh, 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 join the West in, in the various uh, uh, forms. So this is a broad scale attack, and this is not all. Of course, as you mentioned in the beginning, Andreas, we also have uh, the <clears throat> Belarusian uh, uh, migration uh, uh, provocations and a lot more. Uh, in particular, the US uh, in the last couple of days have warned the European allies of uh, the Russian uh, uh, military mobilization around Ukraine. This is serious. And uh, this is just the beginning because uh, the, the winter has barely uh, has not really started as yet. We should expect that several countries, in, uh, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe, will see power cuts uh, in in the winter. So, what uh, should be done? Well, I basically agree with what uh, Vladimir Milov and Yerzy Buzek uh, uh, said uh, about this. <clears throat> it uh, should be obvious that the European Commission should investigating market manipulation instantly, and uh, uh, as uh, Vladimir Milov suggested, impose big um, fines instantly. This should be the top issue in the European uh, uh, Commission. And also what Vladimir Milov said, the third energy package should be reinforced. Uh, storage was not part of it. Uh, so uh, Gazprom now owns about a, a quarter of the gas storage in Germany. And it uh, also owns large storage in Austria and in the Netherlands. And it has kept these uh, storage uh, capacities almost empty. So it's entirely Gazprom uh, that has caused the shortage of uh, 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 stored gas in, in Europe uh, now. And uh, suppliers generally should be prohibited from owning uh, storage, for example, uh, Qatar owns one fifth of uh, British uh, gas storages, which in the same way as Gazprom, it, it has kept uh, uh, empty because it prefers to sell the LNG to, <clears throat> to China uh, now. And then uh, there should be some uh, uh, regulation of storage. Uh, the, the, uh, the European Commission should uh, insist, uh, regulate simply a certain minimum level of uh, uh, gas uh, uh, storage. And <clears throat> then uh, uh, the, the question, I think it's uh, former Polish uh, Prime Minister Donald Tusk who has brought up that uh, if uh, the European Union should negotiate uh, as a unit with Gazprom, uh, if one should, uh, simply should uh, change the uh, market model in uh, order to control Gazprom, because uh, Gazprom overwhelmingly exports only to Europe through pipelines. Uh, so uh, the European Union has a massive market power if it uh, chooses to act <clears throat> as one actor and uh, can sort it out. You might say that this is to abandon the market model, but if you are fighting a monopolist, you might have a better to act as a 
monopsonies? That's a big question. But then we have uh, uh, the question, why has the European Commission and uh, largely the European Union ignored this crisis? Well, it is because of the idea of a green deal. We don't need fossil fuel now. The fossil fuel accounts for 80% of all um, energy today, that it must be supplied meanwhile. Uh, today already, uh, coal investments cannot be financed. No bank, uh, bonds, or other financing is available for uh, coal investment. And coal is still needed. We can't st uh, stop all uh, uh, coal-powered uh, uh, power plants. And we are coming to a similar situation with uh, gas plants. And here I will pick up this uh, question about uh, uh, new gas uh, fired power plants in Germany. Well, Germany has put itself in a hopeless situation. It has lots of good nuclear power, which has functioned well and is, uh, could be qualified as green. And uh, in 2011, for no good reason. Chancellor Merkel said, we are not going to have nuclear power any longer. The sensible decision in Germany, of course, should be to use the nuclear power a bit longer. But uh, as you mentioned, that they would not work very well with the Greens in the, the new uh, <clears throat> uh, parliament. Uh, Germany still uses a lot of lignite and brown coal for power generation, particularly in East Germany, which is the worst uh, form of um, uh, in energy and that should not be encouraged. So what do you do? Okay, then you jump on gas. Uh, Germany needs to rethink its whole uh, energy policy and nuclear power for a bit longer uh, should be the answer rather than uh, uh, lignite or new uh, gas power, uh, power stations. In the same way, I mean, Sweden and, uh, and France uh, uh, sh should uh, uh, stick to their nuclear power for a bit uh, longer. Uh, President Macron uh, said so just uh, the other day, and I uh, welcome uh, th that uh, ap uh, approach. And um, uh, <clears throat> the, the EU must uh, get a realistic attitude. Yes, gas is acceptable as a transitory uh, uh, source of energy. It's better than, uh, than coal. Uh, Europe must have uh, energy. We cannot uh, dream about green energy when altogether uh, green energy, that, that is wind and solar, account for 3% of the total global uh, energy supply uh, at present. We have to be realistic. And uh, this is something that uh, should come out of this crisis. Crisis. And uh, the European Commission has massively underperformed both the comp uh, Competition Commissioner and the uh, Energy Commissioner in this uh, case, and the Commission as a whole. This is not acceptable. And of course, uh, to conclude, uh, I think that uh, Nord Stream 2 should not be certified at all by the, the European uh, Commission because uh, uh, Gazprom has proven that it's not uh, uh, reliable. It has not uh, uh, complied with the first con uh, condition of the certification. And uh, therefore uh, Nord Stream 2 should be left uh, uh, unused on, on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Anders. Thanks a lot, really, as always, you you have very, very, very broad and very deep insights. So thanks a lot for, for participating with us in that very important discussion. Now, before I will move to uh, our, our speakers from uh, Ukraine and Moldova, uh, I, again, I would, I would remind our, our logistical uh, you know, arrangement that the questions should be put on the chat. Somebody was asking, you know, the floor, but they should be put in a written form that everybody from the panel should be able to read. And, uh, and that is how we are organizing today's discussion. Now I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Alexander Sherba, who is chief advisor to Naftogaz uh, CEO for coordination of international affairs. We know that really Ukraine is, is uh, 
it's in that discussion, you know, on, on what Gazprom is doing and, uh, you know, and what, what does it mean Nord Stream 2 and, and the whole, you know, the future of, uh, of uh, Ukrainian uh, transit pipelines. Uh, the whole system is very, is very important for the whole Europe. So pleasure, pleasure to have you, uh, Mr. Alexander, and, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kubilius. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, well, um, first of all, thank you for conducting this event. Uh, I completely agree with the speakers who said that uh, there are not enough of those and uh, there is not enough awareness uh, in Europe uh, about uh, how important this uh, uh, crisis is for, um, for Europe's uh, outlook for the future. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, a number of speakers uh, mentioned uh, something that's on Ukraine's heart and mind right now, and what is uh, at heart of this crisis, namely uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, certification. Uh, so I will uh, probably uh, speak more about that. Uh, I have 26 years of my diplomatic over diplomatic career be, uh, behind my back. Uh, my last six and a half years I spent as uh, Ukrainian ambassador in Austria. And whenever I mentioned uh, uh, Nord Stream 2 to my Austrian friends and colleagues, the response was usually, uh, well, well we, we need it, so we'll build it, but uh, we won't uh, let it become a problem uh, either for you or for the European Union. Isn't the word of Madam Chancellor enough for you? Of course, uh, after we got uh, a word, uh, an honest uh, a word of, of, of honor from Russia, J Russia, America, Great Britain, and France, uh, in exchange uh, for uh, Ukrainian nuclear weapons, and then only to lose a big part of our territory. Um, so these uh, oral uh, agreements and uh, these promises are not something that uh, uh, makes it for us. But anyways. Here we are in, 20, in the year, uh, in November uh, 2021. Uh, Ukraine's warnings weren't heard. Uh, this uh, monstrosity called uh, uh, Nord Stream 2 has been built and it has become a problem uh, even before it got certified. Uh, uh, it's a problem for U Ukraine. Ukraine feels uh, betrayed over it. Europe feels uh, split over it. And Russia seems to be encouraged in its worst behavior of it. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid to say uh, in its uh, darkest expectations. Uh, and this is what, what we should really uh, talk about. And I'm glad that uh, Mr. Buzek and Mr. Milov uh, mentioned this. What is in it for Russia? We Ukrainians uh, are, uh, we have this advantage or disadvantage, I don't know. We uh, can listen to what Russia, uh, what, what Putin, the Kremlin says to Russians and how Putin and Kremlin sells this whole uh, situation to the Russian population, has been selling it uh, or predicting it for, for years. And uh, namely, um, the, uh, the uh, expectation of the, the, the world picture that have, they've been selling was this, uh, the time of reckoning for Europe will come. And uh, the moment of truth will come when uh, natural gas prices uh, will skyrocket. And that will be the moment of death for uh, Europe's uh, green delusion. It will be the moment of death for European uh, solidarity. And it will be a moment to shine for the, for the nations that have what counts the most, which is uh, fossil um, fuels and uh, weapons. And because Russia has plenty of those, it will be the moment to shine for Russia. And uh, I'm afraid to say, but it is a moment of truth for Europe right now. And we see how uh, energy is being used as a weapon. We see how um, Europe very often chooses to be uh, reality blind uh, to what's happening to it. Uh, and uh, it will be a, really a big answer that Europe has to produce right now. Uh, and uh, uh, Nord Stream 2 would be a big part of this answer, namely, uh, will uh, it allow uh, Putin to become someone who has the, the, the keys to uh, energy future for Europe? 
will it uh, be ready to play by Putin's rules when uh, when uh, deciding on certification in Nord Stream 2? And uh, here is another thing that often gets overlooked um, in Europe, unfortunately. Uh, if uh, Putin is allowed uh, to play this game he plays right now, uh, he will have the key uh, and the possibility to um, kill actually uh, the Green Deal. Uh, it has been mentioned before, and uh, I think it should be stressed again. Um, depending on the situation, uh, it will be a way for Putin and for, for the Kremlin to either uh, make uh, renewables uh, uh, for not financially viable, not, not, not uh, lucrative enough or not sufficient. Uh, um, so will Europe now uh, allow uh, uh, this to happen or not? It's, it's a key question uh, and I don't need to uh, explain this to you. Um, so uh, what's to be done here? Uh, of course, uh, I'm speaking in the name of a country that is, well, extremely worried. I don't want to say terrified, but extremely worried about what's happening uh, with uh, energy prices and uh, with, with this whole um, uh, manipulation uh, that's been conducted by, uh, in our opinion, that's been conducted by the Kremlin in Europe. And I think there are three things that, that are to be done. First of all, uh, we strongly encourage to consider whether, uh, uh, we strongly encourage Europe, the European Union to consider whether uh, what uh, Russia is doing can be seen as market uh, driven, uh, or is it something uh, to be investigated under the antitrust uh, legislation? Uh, second, please, please start to listen what Russia says, not only to your face, but behind your back, because uh, they are getting ready to celebrate the end of uh, uh, all those things that. Uh, uh, Putin's advisor Surkov uh, called in his manifesto European chimeras, namely uh, solidarity, democracy, uh, um, the, all these things that Russia thinks are just deployed to, uh, to conquer uh, Europe and to conduct some kind of special operation against, against Russia. And um, uh, third of all, if you do decide to certify this uh, Nord Stream 2 monstrosity, then please, please uh, do it under your rules and not under Putin's. Don't listen to uh, all these, you know, uh, arrogant uh, pleads or arrogant demands uh, coming from Russia. Just let uh, the uh, this project work and uh, the problems will go away. They won't go away and we should be smart enough to understand that. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Ambassador. Really, uh, very important points you raised. And I see that, you know, I would, uh, again, use an opportunity to urge you now the panelists to look into the chat because questions are arriving, you know, in, 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 in big, big quantities. So uh, some of them are addressed to all the speakers, some of them are addressed you know, personally to some, you know, some of the speakers. So please look, you know, because uh, we shall have quite, quite half an hour, you know, to, to, to look into the questions and, and to continue our discussion. Now, really, again, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Sergio Tofilat, Energy Security Analyst at Community Watchdog uh, from Moldova. Vice President of Party of Change and former advisor of, on energy to the President of the Republic of Moldova. So, uh, Sergio, please, floor is yours. We, we were following how Moldova was, was going through all those, you know, Kremlin challenges and Gazprom challenges. So, please tell us how things are looking like now. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. I'm glad to be here. Uh, actually, this year Moldova was caught in, in, in the worst possible situation. Uh, we had a midterm uh, contract with Gazprom. Uh, the price was set uh, based on a, a formula linked to petrol market to average gas prices that Gazprom exports to European Union. Uh, 
So Moldova, beginning with 2007, was paying fully the average European uh, price for gas. Now, this contract uh, it was expiring uh, on September 30. At uh, the same time, we had in July parliamentary elections. Uh, a pro, pro Western, pro European party won the majority. Uh, the government was established in August. And uh, there was a meeting in August between uh, the President Maya Sandu and Dmitry Kozak. And there were no signs that Gazprom is not willing to uh, extend the agreement. Uh, what happened in the last days of September? Gazprom uh, switched us to spot prices, which are three, four times higher than the previous uh, price, according to the formula. Uh, Gazprom decreased the volumes of gas for Moldova by one third. Uh, and uh, also uh, the spokesman of Gazprom said that Moldova has a so-called gas debt. Well, uh, this, is not, this is not a new scenario. A uh, very similar happened in Ukraine in 2014, after the annexation of Crimea. Gazprom increased twice the price of gas for Ukraine and also pretended to uh, recover uh, a gas debt. So it's nothing new, it's something uh, Moscow is using against uh, uh, democratic governments to force them to, to obey or, or to keep them in the uh, Russian sphere of uh, influence. Uh, so, um, uh, what I also want, want to mention, uh, uh, the gas contract was uh, extended one year ago, so in 2020. At that time, uh, the parliamentary majority was uh, belonging to the Socialist Party, backed by Moscow. So in 2020, Gazprom didn't ask any questions about the gas debt, no questions about the formula, because uh, the power was a pro-Russian party. Now the, the situation was, uh, was different. At the same time, uh, so the spokesman of Gazprom, uh, Mr. Kupriyanov, said that uh, the purpose of Gazprom is purely co a commercial one. And uh, uh, at the same time, we see that Gazprom doesn't ask anything about the a huge gas debt of, uh, of the breakaway Transnistrian region. It exceeds $7 billion. So obviously, uh, their affirmation that Gazprom has a purely commercial agenda is wrong. Uh, what we've seen also is besides the, the decrease of volume of gas by one third, uh, we have um, another subversive activities on the electricity side. Uh, Moldova depends very much on the power plant located in the breakaway Transnistria. And this power plant is controlled also by a Russian company, by Interrao. So MGRES, this power plant decreased the output of electricity by 20, 25%. And this led to a huge inflow of electricity from Ukraine. So this was another instrument, instrument of pressure uh, on uh, Moldovan government. Uh, right after uh, uh, Gazprom switched us to spot prices, uh, they unofficially they uh, put some political conditionalities. We've seen uh, this in press uh, in the article of Financial Times. It's uh, it was an attempt to convince Moldova to give up on EU association agreement uh, to establish. Uh, to have a, uh, an agreement on the Russian army that is located in Transnistria, very similar to uh, Russian army in Crimea. Uh, and uh, another point was the federalization of Moldova and Transnistria, so, so that this breakaway region would have a veto right concerning the foreign policy of Moldova. Uh, it didn't work because our government uh, refused to uh, debate on political conditions. And this is mainly to, uh, due to the fact that Moldova uh, has increased its, uh, its uh, energy security concerning the gas supplies within the last two years. And this was done purely to external factors. In 2019, it was an uncertainty of gas transit through Ukraine. And a number of countries, including Ukraine, Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, 
upgraded the Trans-Balkan pipeline uh, to work in the reverse flow. At the same time, we had uh, finalized the interconnector on gas with Romania. So now Moldova is in a much better situation uh, if we are to compare it with the, uh, 2019. Uh, we even managed to buy some, uh, some small amounts of gas on the European uh, markets. So now we are not anymore dependent on a single gas supplier. The problem is, again, on electricity side. We generate only 20% of electricity internally. The other 80% comes either from the power plant in Transnistria, which burns Russian gas and builds up our gas debt, or the other supplier is Ukraine. However, uh, four out of five high voltage power lines that interconnect us with Ukraine are tied up with the substation at uh, MGRES power plant in Transnistria. So this is our vulnerable point. Uh, we still depend on Russian gas to generate uh, electricity. Uh, at the same time, the Transnistrian uh, region is the weak point for Russia. Uh, Gazprom was used uh, by the Kremlin administration to support the separatist regime by supplying gas, but uh, by not asking its repayment. And this gas is converted into hard currency. So it is uh, resold to local consumers in Transnistria, mainly to uh, factories that are owned by Russian businesses. And all that income that is uh, uh, received from reselling gas in Transnistria goes straight into the Transnistrian budget. So when we switch up, when we turn up the light in Moldova, we basically finance the separatist regime. So this uh, dependency was used by Moscow to keep Moldova under Russian sphere of influence and to force us to finance this separatist regime. And uh, since Moldova now has a possibility to buy gas from other sources, uh, we can stop the supply of gas to Transnistria if they don't pay. And this means that Moscow won't have the possibility to de deliver gas because Gazprom is a public company. It cannot allow itself to sign a contract with a, a non-recognized Tiraspol Transgas Pridnestrovi. This is similar to, I don't know, signing a contract with uh, Al-Qaeda gas or Taliban gas. So that's why they needed this agreement with Moldova gas uh, to keep uh, supplying gas to Transnistria. Finally, uh, both, uh, both sides reached an agreement in October. Uh, we received a more or less decent formula. It's 70% of the, the price uh, is linked to petrol market. 30% is linked to spot uh, prices of gas. This is in winter season. Uh, in uh, summer, it's vice versa. Uh, what is important, we managed to keep the gas transit through Ukraine. So it's not the case of Hungary uh, who switched to the Turkish stream. This is very important to preserve our good relationship with the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, government. And uh, what else? Two important things were uh, also agreed between Moldovan side and Russian side. First is to have an audit on the so-called gas debt, because uh, Moldova gas uh, has never been audited be beginning with its establishment back in 1998. And it was actually a source of uh, corrupting Moldovan political elites uh, because of the multi-million embezzlement of funds. So actually Gazprom turned a blind eye on the corruption schemes that took place at Moldova Gas to corrupt Moldovan political elites in such a way that to preserve the scheme of gas supply in, in Transnistria. So uh, we will have an audit of, uh, of the gas debt. And second, uh, Gazprom asked us to delay the unbundling and certification of Moldova Gas. Today, according to the legislation, uh, Moldova Gas is obliged to uh, grant third party access to any gas trader. Uh, however, the process of unbundling and certification is not finished. Uh, if you ask, if you'll ask my personal opinion, we actually can implement a third energy package uh, without even the, the acceptance of Gazprom. But uh, the main purpose is to have competition to have lower prices. 
And now it's not the case. It's, there is no trader willing and able to offer uh, cheaper gas prices for Moldova. Uh, it may be in summer, during summer, but okay, during summer, the consumption is about 15, 20%. So I don't see any reasons for uh, Moldova gas to block any, um, to block the access for any foreign trader. Uh, I believe we got, we managed to strengthen our positions, mainly due to diversification of gas supply routes. But the problem still lays on the electricity side. We need to build a, a power line that will interconnect us with Romania. We need an additional power line with Ukraine, uh, which will uh, avoid to pass the Transnistrian uh, side, so that we won't be any more dependent on uh, the power plant in Transnistria. It means another two, three years of uh, investments in infrastructure. And then our positions will be uh, much, much better. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Andrews, your microphone is turned off. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I thank you, you know, Sergei, so for, for real, very important information. Andrews. Andrews. Yeah, because I will give you exactly. Yes, I, I'm giving you the floor. No. Yeah, yeah, you because I question. should leave okay. in a few yeah, minutes. Okay. And last two speeches were very important for all of us, I'm sure of that. Also for the European Union, both uh, Ukraine and Moldova uh, are the members of energy community with our acute. So I am very glad that third energy package is quite natural issue for you. Some good news from Moldova. But let me say what we can do as European Union to support your situation, because I could understand very well uh, uh, what uh, was uh, uh, said uh, uh, from Ukraine that um, speeding up the certification of the Nord Stream 2 uh, would circumvent the Ukrainian transit road, depriving the country from uh, transit revenue and exposing it to the to, to, to further Russian political, economic, and military pressure. Very, very dangerous. What can we do? First of all, consecutive implementation of the European Parliament, European Commission positions on Nord Stream 2, which does not contribute to the EU's energy policy objectives, such as energy security or diversification of supplies. This is the reason why the European Parliament, European Commission do not support uh, Nord Stream 2 politically is no support. Of course, we cannot say for private investors stop investing, but um, the European Parliament will use its powers to make sure that all EU law, it means revised gas directive, of course, third energy package, is effectively uh, and fully implemented applied and enforced by Nord Stream 2. As, as former European Parliament rapporteur of the gas director, I raised this point in my recent letter to the Commission and also passed it to Commissioner for Energy, Katri Simpson, uh, at our meeting last month, each, each a committee. So point number two, very important, supporting the energy efficiency programs in both countries, together with uh, Green Deal, I'm very glad that Ukraine, for, for the UK's present declaration to cooperate with the European Union on the Green Deal. And number three, investing in development of Ukraine's and Moldova own resources. Uh, it was, as far as I remember, on 21st, 22nd October in Kiev, a Ukraine Gas Investment Congress. Very positive signal for the whole European Union. And number four, ensuring possibility to provide gas to Ukraine and Moldova from the EU, other countries via interconnectors if Russia cuts supply. And maybe uh, the most general issue, which is also uh, very, very important, that we as European Union should uh, continuously support political and economic uh, reforms in both countries. As I said, we are part of energy community 
uh, Eastern Partnership, and uh, we've got also our big program, Associate Agreement and Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. So we should uh, prepare all the possibilities to support your investment also in gas market, in electricity market. It will be our, our responsibility as European Union. It's, it's my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Andrews. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Yerzy. Thanks a lot for being with us and then good, good travel back, back home, you know. Thank yeah. you very much. And we shall continue our, our conversations here. As I said, you know, we have now a little bit less than uh, half an hour for questions and answers. And uh, really, I see that, you know, quite many questions are very similar, despite, despite you know, different uh, uh, participants putting them. Uh, Hanna Hupko, Natalie Richardson, Alfonso Brazos, Igor Stukalenko, you know, all of them, they're asking, uh, you know, questions connected uh, with Nord Stream 2 and future of Green Deal. And, and the same was a uh, question, you know, to, uh, to us from Lithuanian journalists, which, uh, you know, on, on German new government plans, you know, to build new uh, gas, uh, uh, gas, gas stations to produce electricity. Uh, so maybe we can elaborate a little bit on that. And, and Darius Pranskus, I see again from Facebook came with a question on how much you know what uh, we can call corruption inside of EU is part of all all what we see you know uh, of those developments with you know Nord Stream two and and things like that. Of course, we we remember very much you know who is who in in uh, in you know in Nord Stream two uh, leadership uh, like former Chancellor uh, Schroeder and things like that. So those are the questions, you know, and I would like to ask, you know, maybe, and I saw in the chat, uh, Anders uh, put uh, very clearly some kind of information on, on, uh, on American position uh, uh, towards Nord Stream 2. So maybe I will, yeah, I will ask then Anders, maybe you will be the first one to explain uh, what, what will happen with Nord Stream 2, at least from, from <clears> American <throat> point of view. Then Vladimir, uh, you know, you have uh, several questions, including that question from from Lithuanian journalists. Maybe you will elaborate, and then we shall go in our round. So Anders, maybe uh, I will give floor to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrews. Yes, I put uh, uh, the, the question was if Nord Stream Two will really be uh, uh, completed and uh, utilized. And uh, my answer is not at all obvious. The US Congress has adopted three anti Nord Stream 2 laws. Uh, they have been a part of um, the, the two laws has been part of the National Defense Authorization Act that is being adopted usually in late uh, December and is, is a must pass bill. The last one was about 5,000 pages. So these are massive pieces of legislation. And uh, uh, a couple of hundreds of laws are piggybacked on it. And uh, it's already determined that there will be a new uh, law on um, Nord Stream 2 the sanctions, which will then come uh, in force around New Year. And unlike the two previous um, uh, uh, sanction acts, this one will have no uh, exemption. The, uh, the administration, the president, that is, will not be able to waive sanctions against Nord Stream 2 AG. And uh, in order to uh, operate as an international company, you need to operate in dollars. And that means that Nord Stream 2 AG would not be able to operate in US dollars. And uh, that would, as far as I understand, block it. So we should expect that Nord Stream 2 will be blocked. Then with regard to certification, what the, the German authority has said is that it uh, is not likely to be done until April. And uh, it's not, uh, not the physical completion that is important, but um, that uh, uh, it's really approved. And then uh, a third thing is that uh, uh, the European Court of Justice has already limited 
the, the usage of Nord Stream 2, I think is 25 BCM, that cannot be used out of a capacity of 55 BCM, according to current court decisions. So Nord Stream 2 is not a given. And uh, of course, the German government could do something, but uh, to judge from what has been publicized about the uh, coalition uh, discussions, that is not uh, becoming the case. All the, uh, the Greens have been strongly against uh, Nord Stream 2. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Anders, really, for, for uh, brilliant information about how things can develop. Now, Vladimir, should you, you know, answer the questions which, uh, you know, we we'll put on, on the chat, please. Yes, thank you. And uh, that's a very, very important and thoughtful uh, discussion. And on Nord Stream 2, I think the, uh, clearly the main argument of the proponents and quiet backers of this project in Europe is uh, pool of Putin's little helpers. They were saying, yes, it might be bad for Ukraine, uh, might bring some uh, negative geopolitical effects, but it's overall needed, as they say, for uh, the European energy security. Now, from this recent crisis, we clearly see that more dependence on Gazprom is actually bad for the European uh, energy security. They are quietly waiting in an ambush to actually eat you uh, and try to destroy uh, a lot of positive uh, infrastructure and frameworks that have been built uh, in Europe in the past 20 years. Competitive energy market, which there was a brilliant analysis by uh, the International Energy Agency, which says, despite short term pain in form of recent price surge, Europe had actually saved tens of billions of euros in energy bills because of uh, EU market liberalization of the past couple of decades and introduction of competition. And now Putin is clearly aiming at reversing it, uh, bringing us back to the prehistoric era of uh, uh, long-term contracts that were um, meant to, to bound uh, consumers to one particular supplier and uh, make them market slaves forever. They really want to go back to restore that architecture. They are really aiming at destroying the European Green Deal, which is, I totally agree with uh, President Buzik, uh, uh, this is a, a very significant threat to future market uh, positions of Gazprom. So all the good that Europe has achieved in the past uh, 20, 25 years, right now we clearly saw in the face of this crisis that uh, Gazprom is aiming to destroy. Uh, now, how can we possibly talk about launching and certifying Nord Stream 2 without analyzing all this big picture that we saw in the past uh, weeks and months. We saw the real face of uh, Putin's Russia and Gazprom and what they actually do when they have market leverage to squeeze anything they can uh, out of Europe. How can this uh, discussion on Nord Stream 2 can be possibly separated from these uh, past events? Uh, however, uh, if we look at the overall uh, picture of European policy making, yes, uh, there is a very strong position by the European Parliament, both on uh, Nord Stream 2 and the negative uh, market monopolistic role of uh, Gazprom, but unfortunately not on the side of European Commission. When we listen to Frank Timmermans or Kadri Simpson, they try to shrug off, say that no, it's not Gazprom, it's natural, you know. Uh, the, the price surge is a result of a fundamental issues and market manipulation has nothing to do with it. I think this is wrong. This is leading Europe the, the wrong way. Uh, this actually plays into the hands of Putin who want to destroy the competitive architecture of European gas market, destroy the Green Deal and bring us back to the bad old times of monopolism and protected territories. I don't understand this passive position of the European Commission. And others, I, I wanted to suggest that why don't we work to write a white paper uh, on the recent crisis? Uh, I'm sure the uh, participants of this discussion can greatly contribute to that. Uh, seriously analyzing the, the reasons for this crisis, uh, what uh, had driven the price surge, the role of market manipulation gas of Gazprom and uh, policy recommendations connected with that. If European uh, Commission does not want to do that, maybe we should do it and present it as a public paper 
so that at least people will be able to seriously uh, discuss the roots uh, of the recent crisis. This will also have great implications on the uh, process of uh, certification of Nord Stream 2, which is moving uh, obviously towards uh, the next year. So I think we should do it. And last, I wanted to conclude with, uh, with one important point that that others have raised. Uh, actually, Europe has a lot of leverage over Gazprom. It's the biggest buyer uh, of the Russian gas, and essentially the only buyer, because their efforts to move away to the Chinese market have not been terribly successful. They are uh, supplying but a fraction of gas to China only from two very remote Eastern Siberian fields who never had any chance to become a source for uh, European gas market. So all this Kremlin's bluff that if you misbehave, we switch to China as a consumer, it just didn't work. So I think Europe should realize its strength and its market leverage that it has on Gazprom. And uh, uh, take a look at the Moldova example. Thanks uh, to Mr. Tokilov for brilliantly explaining this. Uh, Moldova is a small country, but it had certain leverage on Putin and it used it to prevent a major gas supply crisis from happening and to force Gazprom into concluding a new contract. Europe obviously is much bigger and much stronger, so it should not underestimate its strength. And I think we should go back to the discussion that we had uh, 20 years ago uh, when Russia was discussing WTO accession terms with the European Union. There were many policymakers in Europe at that time who said uh, monopolist Gazprom is a threat to European energy security. So we should push for opening up of the Russian gas industry, for introducing competition in uh, Russian uh, gas output, breaking up Gazprom and creating competitive environment. Actually, if these efforts had succeeded 20 years ago, we would not have witnessed this uh, severity of the crisis of the European gas market, uh, which we see right now, which is man-made, Gazprom-made. So I think we should go back demanding that uh, uh, Russian upstream gas industry is finally broken apart and liberalized, uh, becomes competitive, which would significantly contribute to removal of this monopolistic threat to a uh, whole European space. Again, I would reiterate, uh, Putin uh, wrongly associates the interests of Russia with his selfish geopolitical interests and interests of uh, monopolist Gazprom. Russian interests are different. Russian reputation long term suffers badly from this monopolistic crisis that uh, have occurred. So it's in, in our mutual interest uh, that Russian gas industry is reformed, uh, Gazprom broken apart and a competitive environment created instead, which would eliminate threats like we have witnessed for uh, a long period ahead. So I think we should go back to the European demands that were that were put forward 20 years ago, but then unfortunately they became uh, sidelined and everybody accepted Gazprom's monopoly such as it is. So the big suggestion is that Europe needs to be proactive uh, and Europe needs to realize its strength and act in full force because it suffered a lot uh, during this market manipulation crisis. I think we should also do a white paper on that, um, outlining policy recommendations if European Commission is a bit slow in that matter. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Vladimir, for a brilliant idea, which I am immediately you know, picking up on, on really preparing some kind of white paper. Knowing your, your capabilities, uh, you know, I see um, you know, that possibility uh, to, to, to do it. You know, uh, if we shall pick also you know, Anders uh, with his you know, capabilities, that would be brilliant, brilliant you know, Paper, I, I am uh, I am ready to convince Yeshe to be part of that, despite the fact that he he left, you know, to, to Warsaw. So and all others also should be invited. Let's let's do it. And I see also this is as some kind of you know the first step towards what we were discussing earlier in in different you know occasions, perhaps the last time on on on, uh, on this big conference that we need to start some kind of discussions and preparation of papers how it will look like you know EU relationship with democratic Russia when it will come and and the first uh, question will be really what will be the relationship uh, in that case in energy sector it could be totally different you know because now what we see 
and that is my my perhaps attempt to answer the questions which I got also you know from at least from Lithuanian journalists. Uh, what we see really is that Putin is trying to blackmail Europe, you know, for two reasons, and that was uh, they were speaking openly, you know, both both uh, both Putin and Peskov. I remember Peskov what you know two months ago when the prices started to rise up, when he said that when well well while you know uh, winter storages are you know still not filled up and when the prices are going up for gas. Uh, maybe that is a good evidence for those. Uh, he used even the word, you know, crazy politicians in Europe, which are opposing, you know, Nord Stream two, uh, to 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 become silent. That was very clear, clear message, you know, blackmail message, you know. And uh, and second, you know, of course, what we spoke, uh, I remember very well our conclusions in our previous energy seminar. Uh, in July, perhaps, when we were discussing about geopolitical consequences of Green Deal, when we, you know, uh, saw from from uh, you know from experts, which published uh, published, you know, from European uh, Council on Foreign Relations, which published a really important paper on, on on geopolitical consequences of Green Deal and how much it can influence, you know, in the longer term, you know, Russian uh, economical structure. Because if 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 to take uh, if to pick you know commission forecast on green deal that you know uh, gas consumption uh, after 2030 will go down by 70 percent in Europe that will mean you know major major impact on on uh, all the Russian economical structure perhaps on political structure also and then we concluded in our seminar that really uh, we should be ready to see Kremlin attempts really to destroy Green Deal as such, you know, uh, in, in whatever, you know, in whatever uh, ways. And, uh, and that is what we see. But I think that again, you know, Kremlin, what we learned uh, during last, you know, decades, sometimes Kremlin is behaving in a very, in a very you know, I would say unprudent way, unrational way. Because they brought so many, you know, evidence that Europe cannot stay, you know, uh, dependent on Gazprom. That Gazprom is not any more reliable, you know, supplier. That you know, it's really it's it's helpful for <laughs> for those who really want to push, you know, uh, forward Nord Stream two, uh, uh, Green Deal, you know, and to abandon Nord Stream two. Because why we need to have this Nord Stream two, which will increase. Uh, dependence of you know of Germany, dependence of European markets on on Gazprom. I do not see any 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 you know rational argument. Opposite, Gazprom gave us a lot of you know uh, arguments uh, really not to trust anymore in 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 Gazprom you know reliability, and that is what I hope even in Germany they will start to understand. So. Uh, well, I cannot answer why German government is looking. Anders perhaps explained all the economical, you know, reasons why German government now is forced by by herself, you know, wrong decisions against nuclear power, you know, to look into some kind of uh, gas power stations, you know. But it's that that does not uh, demand to have, you know, Nord Stream two operation. There are other possibilities, really, to have. Uh, you know, as a transitional uh, energy resource, you know, gas supplies. Uh, we in Lithuania, we have shown that, for example, NG terminal can be very good, you know, instrument from that point of view. So uh, that's that's possibilities to develop some kind of this infrastructure also, you know, uh, for Germany. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that again, I agree absolutely with Vladimir with you that Europe and Germany, including, you know, uh, has a lot of instruments now when, when still we are buying, you know, uh, gas from gas, we have a lot of influence, possibilities to influence both gas from and Kremlin policies. You know, if we shall be tough, if we shall say, you know, uh, we shall diminish uh, gas, gas imports from Russia, if Russia will, will behave in such a stupid way, that is what we can do. So that's my my answer. You know, it's it's uh, it's you know let's let's be much more clear. Let's be much more you know tough and effective in defending our our geopolitical interests, 
And let's look how we can help also you know, Ukraine and Moldova. And that is that should be our answer to you know uh, this uh, I would say very nervous Gazprom and Kremlin uh, behavior what we see now you know with uh, attempts you know to increase gas gas uh, prices which totally destroys you know reliability of of Gazprom with everything else what they are doing you know with with uh, with this you know hybrid war on on, on Belarusian border and so on and so on. Kremlin is becoming very nervous. So let's 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 see you know let's see exactly that side of, of Kremlin behavior. Sorry for maybe too long my my attempts to to give an answer, but now I am I am turning again to our Ukrainian and and um, and Moldavian friends. Maybe you have some some also additional comments. So, Alexander Sherb, Ambassador, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to respond uh, to. Uh, and of course, uh, remark uh, uh, what the transatlantic community can uh, do, what kind of answer uh, transatlantic community can uh, make uh, to this uh, uh, energy uh, crisis right now. And uh, the uh, it was a huge disappointment, quite frankly, that the transatlantic answer so far was what uh, President Biden and uh, Chancellor Merkel agreed upon that uh, basically to trust uh, Putin's uh, good intentions, so to say, and to, 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 to go ahead to, to green light this project. I hope that uh, with participation of uh, uh, the US Congress that was mentioned by um, uh, Anders, um, there would be a different uh, answer to this question with participation of energy uh, of uh, European Commission and uh, all people who are ready to be strong in this crucial uh, period of time. That's my general, very general answer. I'm not ready to give any, any more uh, specifics. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And then, uh, Sergio, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. We also should take into account that this is a temporary situation with uh, extremely high prices because high prices, high profitability brings new players into the market. We've seen that some uh, businesses in US, in, uh, in Qatar, in Egypt already announced that within the next uh, two, three years, they will almost double the LNG terminal capacity. So there will be more LNG on the market, and this could, in a way, uh, in a way help to balance the prices. Uh, concerning the the probable reactions of EU towards this uh, blackmail from Gazprom, uh, we've seen that uh, this shredderization uh, activity seems to be quite efficient. But at the same time, uh, one thing that I learned uh, since I, I came to uh, uh, more in public is that politicians usually react when there is a demand in society. Uh, if not, uh, they have political costs. So our purpose, I think, uh, is to bring to the grassroots to explain them uh, how their rights and how their welfare is affected by these actions taken by Gazprom and all together to put pressure on the decision makers uh, to take actions to implement decisions so that uh, EU, uh, EU countries, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and others won't be in, uh, in, in future, won't be in the same situation as today. Okay, good, good. So, dear colleagues, dear, dear participants, and, and uh, first of all, dear speakers, Really, I think this was really a good, good seminar. Uh, no, trying to understand what is going on. I think that we came to some kind of conclusions about uh, gas from, you know, and Kremlin attempts to blackmail, which, uh, you know, uh, perhaps um, can help us to understand that gas from really is not a reliable partner. And uh, and uh, again, you know, thanks to Vladimir Milov, uh, I understood that we have the task now to, to work on some kind of uh, paper, white paper, which really would, would be very helpful for, for, you know, EU itself and for decision makers in, in, in Europe, you know. 
and and uh, I hope that really uh, that would uh, you know that will help us to understand what are the challenges, what are the issues which we need to look for for solutions, and uh, uh, really having in mind not only the situation inside of EU but also in our in our you know Eastern neighborhood countries, Eastern partnership countries like Ukraine, like Moldova. You know, even Belarus, we have our questions from, from Mr. Kovalchuk about, you know, how much uh, Europe is ready to help uh, democratic Belarus when, 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 when the change will come, you know, with, uh, you know, with, with assistance to resolve uh, their energy, energy issues. That is, again, important topic, which we need to have in mind and we need to discuss also with, with experts about that. So, well, Again, uh, my conclusion is very simple. Thanks a lot to everybody, you know, for 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 the presence, you know, and for your really very very deep insights into what is going on. Thanks a lot for uh, all those who assisted us to to have this seminar. Uh, good luck, good health, you know, and let's hope for you know better future and for lower gas prices. <laughs> Thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks. Bye. Let's keep in touch. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah. Okay. Bye.